This talk is, will be modeling and simulation of physical systems for hobbyists. Manuel Eipel wanted to lower the threshold entry, entry thresholds for the subject, and so explaining mo modeling and simul simul simulation techniques that help even small projects for makers and hobbyists. So please welcome Manuel for the talk about modeling simulation and phys for f of physical systems for hobbyists. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction, and welcome everybody. Um, actually, I forgot uh, to say that uh, all examples that I will show in this talk um, can be downloaded on the website of the talk. So if you want to um, yeah, try it out already right now, while I'm actually going to show the examples, you can do so. So let's get started by taking about this title a little bit to see what is meant by the individual words. And by this, have a rough outline of what we're going to talk about. So first, modeling in this context means to create a mathematical description of a system. So we look at the physics of, for example, a robot that we want to build, or a mechanism, then we extract the different phys physical ex effects, look at the equations uh, that uh, rep are represented in these effects, put it all together, and then we obtain a mathematical description. And simulation then means that once we have this system, this model, we are going to use the computer to perform calculations from one time step to the next. So to basically extrapolate from an initial state of the system to how the behavior is going to be in time. In this talk, I want to talk about physical systems, so hardware that we can create um, and not some sort of uh, fictional uh, physics for computer games or something, but really something like a mobile robot, a small drone, or similar, that, yeah, as a maker, you want to um, create. And I'm addressing this talk to hobbyists. I don't want to reduce the uh, knowledge and competences of um, hobbyists, but only say by this that the resources that we're going to use in this talk are all commonly available tools and not uh, simulation software that you have to buy for tens of um, thousands and of euros. And I'm not exaggerating about it. Uh, so uh, maybe a quick round, like uh, who did uh, math courses uh, at university level? Okay, yeah, that's quite a lot. So, actually, I prepared the talk um, to address it to everybody who had 10th grade um, school math. So, it might be a bit uh, familiar to, your, to you already, but then you can help your neighbors who have difficulties. So let's get started. What's the motivation behind doing sim uh, simulation? Why do we want to simulate something? So imagine with your friend, you want to build a small um, yeah, self-balancing robot like this. So it's a very easy design, two wheels left and right, uh, which have one motor. Uh, each wheel has one motor. And then there's a rod going up with a camera fixed on top so that uh, you actually have a higher point of view so that you see something. And this is actually um, an inverted pendulum. So if you build it like this without a controller, it will just uh, fall over. But yeah, it's uh, quite easy to implement, uh, at least hardware-wise. So, you want to build this with your friend, and you say, okay, I'm good at uh, programming, but I am not so good with the mechanical aspects. So, your friend says, okay, no problem, I will build the hardware. 
But then you're stuck. OK, you don't have the hardware yet, so how do you want to develop the software if you don't have the hardware? And this is where simulation can help, for example. Um, so in the time that your friend is building the hardware, you can already start the software. You just uh, have your simulator. You recreate uh, the hardware while it's absent. And then you can program your controller, everything that you want. And once the hardware is ready, you keep the controller, you throw away the simulator, and ideally, then the system is complete. So I built a small simulator for, for this example in Python. You can also download the code. Um, so you see here, and the simulation is already run, running, but it's perfectly balanced, so it's not dropping yet. But if I push it a little bit from the side, it will tip over, because I didn't activate the controller yet. So it's like if you have your robot without power, if you push it a little bit, it will tip over. So now I can activate the controller and then push it a little bit. And then you see that the controller will actually bring it back. So this, the controller is the part that you will implement in software. And the hardware is what you, so basically this part, the tipping over part, is the hardware that your friend will build. And um, let's see, I cannot even make it drive around. Just as one example of what you can simulate with uh, the methods that we're going to see. OK, the problem is I don't have that much time. So uh, we're gonna, not going to go all the way. I will start with the very basic um, models. And then we see how far we go. So um, to summarize the motivation, simulation can be used as a placeholder. So while the hardware is built, you have the simulator, and then you exchange it. Or it can be used like for, as a virtual test bench, for example, for scenarios where you don't necessarily want uh, the real hardware because it's risky behavior and it can be damaged. OK. Now, one step back, modeling. What, what is it? And what are the basic foundations? So imagine our friend Newton here uh, under his apple tree. And now we cut the apple loose. And we ask ourselves, OK, what's going to happen? We can look at that at different levels of detail, like from, several, some, from a very simple level to a very detailed level. At the simple level, you could say, OK, the apple moves down. So you see on the plot, the line just goes down, constant velocity. Then. Uh, well, this is an observation that you can make very easily just by looking at it. You don't need to measure anything. Then at the more detailed level, you see that if you make a more precise measurement, actually your apple is accelerating. So you have this parabolic curve. Um, because of the gravitation, the apple becomes faster and faster. And then if you go at an even more detailed level, you notice that there's actually uh, aerodynamic drag. So it won't accelerate infinitely, but it will eventually uh, reach a uh, saturation uh, velocity. This is, for example, when a skydiver is falling from the sky. Uh, yeah, then you clearly notice this effect so at, uh, over a longer period. So the take home message that I want to show with this slide is that actually, depending on the question that you want to look at with your, model, uh, your modeling and your simulation, you should um, choose an appropriate level of detail. So as simple as possible and as detailed as necessary. And this might actually change for the same system. So at one point in time, you might be interested in this uh, starting behavior. So you need the acceleration. And at another point in your project, you might be interested only at what happens here at saturation velocity. OK, now we go uh, even 
one step further back in the mathematical methods. So differentiation and integration, because this is very essential. It, many physical measures are linked to each other through differentiation or integration. For example, if you take the position x, velocity v, and acceleration a, then if you differentiate x, you get uh, velocity v. And if you differentiate that again, then you get the acceleration a. And the other way around, by integration, then you obtain velocity again and the position. So you might remember this equation from school for calculating um, uh, the derivative. So basically, uh, the derivative is defined as the ratio of the function you want to differentiate at two points in time, point t plus h and t. So the difference of this divided by the uh, distance in time, so the h. And if you then have this corner case where uh, h goes towards 0, you actually obtain the uh, derivative at the point t. So in this case, the velocity at the point t. Now, if you take this equation and you modify it a little bit, so you multiply by h and you add the x uh, of t, then you obtain this equation, which is one way of uh, calculating the uh, integration. So x, in this case, at the point t plus h in time. So you see that it depends on the x of t, so a little bit earlier in time. And it also depends on the velocity, so the derivative of x a bit earlier in time multiplied by h. And again, if you can take this corner case where h goes towards 0, then you uh, obtain uh, x of t plus h. So this means, um, actually, by integrating, we can look a tiny little bit into the future because the derivative is always running ahead in time of the uh, function that uh, was differentiated. If you integrate it backwards, you can look a bit in the, into the future, and that's exactly what we want to do in simulation, right? We want to say, OK, we have an initial state at point t, and then we're interested to know what happens at point t plus a little bit. So in the following, we're always going to integrate for the simulation and not differentiate. The only problem now, this corner case definition, that's nice for mathematicians, but it's not really useful for computations. We cannot write this in software. So what we're going to do is the, we're going to use the so-called Euler method. And this simply means that we replace this corner case limit of h going towards 0 of h by a finite uh, value ts, which is often called the sampling period. So finite means we just uh, take a small but uh, defined value and not this limit thingy. And then with TS, we're actually only going to calculate the points in time at integer multiple, uh, multiples of TS. So we call uh, K the index, and then we calculate the points in time at T equals K times TS. So this is uh, discretization. And yeah, so. The, we transform this equation into this one. Uh, we do divide by ts, and we obtain this nice equation, which is uh, x of k plus 1 equals x of k plus v of k times ts. So this is something that we can easily implement in uh, software. We just have a for loop, and every time we do that equation. So I'm going to show you a simple example in spreadsheet, just to show that, well, it's 
pretty independent of uh, what uh, software you use. So let's define some constants here on the left side. Um, we take a sampling period of one millisecond. Let's put the unit here so we have it in seconds. Then we have the index here. We call it K. We have the time here. We call it T. And we're interested in the position. We call it X. And in the velocity, we call it V. So. And now every line here will be one point in time. So we begin at time zero, and everything is uh, zero, like this. Let's get a bit more space here. OK, so now we have this formula. So we need a k plus 1. That's not a problem. We just say, OK, the next k is equal to the previous k plus 1. And the time, oh no, I covered this formula. Uh, the time, we say, is equal to this index k times the sampling period. So we use these dollar signs, so it doesn't change if we copy paste it. And then we have the integration formula, so the x is the previous x times the previous v times the previous velocity, again multiplied by the sampling period, uh, like this, again with the dollar signs. And now, OK, it would be boring if the velocity is 0 all the time, so let's put a velocity of 0.5 meters per second, for example. And now, we want the next moment in time, so we just do the same operation over and over again. So I just copy-paste um, the lines, and this is now the time um, evolution. For example, I can now um, plot um, position over time. I just add this plot. I tell it to take the time on the x-axis and take the position on the y-axis. OK, insert it here. All right, so yeah, it's not very exciting, but it's exactly what we expect if we integrate a constant over time. Um, so we just obtain a straight curve. So let's add the acceleration now. We call it A. OK, we start the acceleration uh, from the beginning, um, like this. And now what we do is we actually use the same formula that we used for the uh, position, so this one. Um, we, cop we also use it for the velocity. We copy-paste it. And then um, we can copy this line. And now, if we want, we can repeat this um, like a bit longer. OK. So you see, now we have a constant acceleration. We integrate two times. So we get the position as a parabola shape like this. Actually, I could have added a negative acceleration just to have the drop from before. So this is already quite useful if we now say, that um, the acceleration input is not a constant, but for example, we have the acceleration input from an from a sensor from an acceleration sensor. Then, just by um, using this method, which doesn't rely on any knowledge of the um, shape of the acceleration, right? So we can just give it random input, and it will always integrate it. So if we have the sensor input from the accelerometer and we integrate it twice, then we can keep track of our position. OK, but now we want to model something. So we don't have an accelerometer yet. So where do we get the acceleration from? OK, one warning. Always keep the sampling period small. We're going to discuss later on what small means. Um, OK, so some building blocks. I cannot obviously not um, summarize all 
physical equations that exist, but in mechan I will show some of equi uh, mechanics and of electromechanics that are useful, like for uh, mobile robots, if you have a motor turning something with gears, maybe, and then a sort of um, lever arm mechanism, for example. So we start from the simplest version, so a moving mass, uh, just uh, imagine a billiard ball, for example, yeah, which has a mass m and a velocity v. And now if we want to change this movement, we need a force f. Again, this is uh, our friend Newton uh, telling us that. And we, this is the second law of motion. So the force that we need is proportional to the mass times uh, the acceleration. OK, I need to accelerate a little bit as well, because timing, time is running out. So um, yeah, actually, I've, uh, so the same equation that you have for linear motions, you also have for uh, rotational motions, which is the right side. And then you can also have the, the weight. So this is what we had in the ex Apple example. So the force from the weight is just the mass times the um, gravitational constant. And other effects that you can have are, for example, spring force and viscous damping. These two are actually not only useful if you truly have a um, spring damper mechanism, like you would have in a suspension, for example, but it's also useful if you, for example, want to model a hard contact. Like, uh, uh, yeah, I had in the uh, beginning, uh, in the simulation example, in the uh, the robot tipping over and falling on the ground. So you just put the um, stiffness quite high and the damping as, as well, and you will obtain this um, effect of an input of a contact. Sorry. So let's see if we now combine this, for example, we want to have um, just for the sake of the example, a small mass spring damper. So we put the gravitation here, we put um, the spring here, and the damper here. Um, yeah, damper. And what I didn't say here is that this F is not uh, necessarily one force, but it's the resultant force. So this is actually a vector addition. So you take all forces together, and then this is the F which uh, drives um, your acceleration. So this is what I'm going to do here. I just tell it, OK, sum um, from here to near, there. And then I need some constants. So for the gravitation, I need the mass. So let's say 2 kilo. It's a bit heavy, but OK, let's make it half a kilo. And then let's say the spring stiffness, um, we just put 100 uh, Newton per meter. And the damper, we let's put 10. So um, of course, this uh, setting of the parameters now I do a bit random, but ideally, you would look at your system um, when you design it and then calculate uh, these values f so that they correspond to what you're actually building. Now I uh, just make a simple example, so I pick them at random. Okay, so then we have the gravitation. We said gravitation was, if we look here, m times g. Um, okay, so I also need the g. So that's the well-known uh, 9.81. Um, meter per second square. So that's the mass. Uh, yeah, the mass times this. We again add the dollar signs. And then we have the spring. So the spring is. I set the x0 at, at 0, so the x0 is the equilibrium position. And so we had minus k times uh, position. And 
Now what you see here, what I didn't say, but if you know a little bit about physics and math, you see that this is actually a differential equation that we're going to solve here. But yeah, you don't need to worry too much uh, right now because the Euler method is taking care of that. Uh, so we also need the damping here times a velocity. Okay. And now I'm just going to copy it all the way down so that I have like 60 minutes, uh, seconds. It takes a bit longer because, yeah, it's a lot. OK, and actually what you see here is that What I said before about the um, sampling period was a problem right now because you are, we're actually are doing an error in the Euler method in the integration. And if the. So normally, because we have this feedback loop in the differential equation, it's not a problem because if there is an error, then it will be compensated in the feedback loop. But if the sampling period is too big, then this uh, error is actually um, yeah, multiplied. And then you get this instability behavior. So I can also show it with a bit bigger effect. Like if I take only 100th of a second, then you see here, if you look at the values, it's actually going to infinity. So my simulation is uh, not robust. And this means that the sampling period is just too big, and the simulation is becoming unstable. So now I picked um, a smaller value, which, of course, is a problem, because now I'm only simulating six seconds instead of 60. But you see that here is a trade-off to make between model uh, complexity uh, and precision, which means more computation um, resources are needed, and um, the um, yeah the robustness of the simulation. Sorry. Uh, OK, so the question was whether this was a resonation. Yeah, right. Um, but in theory, this, OK, maybe I made an error in my calculations. Let me show you the one that I prepared. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to take the one where I prepared it properly, because obviously I made an error in the calculations. Um, so this is uh, the effect that you are expecting, right? So you start at a certain position, then um, you have an oscillation through the spring, which is bringing back the mass, wants to bring back the mass to the center. And then you have a damping, so it slowly fades out. OK, actually, I'm also running out of time. I wanted to also uh, treat some um, ele uh, electric um, principles and electromechanics to show uh, an, uh, an electric motor. I can quickly show it to you um, in, in the slides. And so the nice thing of the electric motor is an example is that it uh, shows how to solve problems where you actually have two equations which are entangled with each other. And you can also see uh, in this example 
the effect of taking into account uh, one physical principle or ignoring it, in this case, the effect of the coil. So, as I said, you can download it from the website and then uh, have a look at it if you're interested. Uh, right, so this brings me uh, already to the end of the talk. Just some tips and tricks to summarize. So, the, as I said, the sampling period needs to be small. As a rough estimate, I usually take around 100 times uh, faster than the system time constant. So for a mechanical system, usually one millisecond is okay. I don't know why now. Well, I had an error before, but um, one millisecond usually works fine. If you have the electric motor with the coil, then you need to reduce the sampling period maybe to 10 microseconds or even less. It depends on um, yeah the system time constant, as I said. Then. Um, as a second point, use uh, block diagrams. So this is uh, what I mean by block diagrams. It helps you to keep track of uh, yeah, which physical measures influence which other physical measures. And, uh, well, it's a bit difficult to read maybe in the beginning, but uh, you get used to it, and then it's really useful. And then if you want to be sure about what you're doing or you're having more complex models, maybe use some uh, specialized tools, for example, SciPy, which has a good uh, ordinary differential equation solver, or OpenModelica with OMEdit, where you can basically just uh, compose your system uh, as you find it. You just add a block for the spring, you add another block for dam the damper, and then it takes care of that or a Scilab with Xcos, where basically you uh, use this block diagram method to define your equations instead of writing them down. And so, as I said, they have better differential equation solving. They're also uh, more efficient because often they use vari variable time step. So uh, they see, okay, when it's critical, to reduce the sampling period and when it's less critical. And also very helpful are the data logging and visualization tools that come with uh, the software. Otherwise, it's sometimes uh, really cumbersome to track, uh, to keep track of all your variables and then plot them nicely. Okay, so Actually, I think I accelerated that much that I still have some time. So I can maybe show you um, how this works in OM Edit, uh, which is also free software. And it's basically a graphical tool to use Open Modelica. And Open Modelica itself is a <coughs> modeling programming like, well, let's say definition language. Uh, okay, something is not working because it's not starting as it should. Okay, then I can show you um, the Python code of the simulator that I showed in the beginning, so this one. Um, so what I did here was um, to define two classes. Um, just to have them run in different th threads, one thread for the simulation and another one for the visualization. And uh, actually the um, simulation part is pretty simple and then vi the visualization part takes <laughs> more lines of code. So you see here that there's a reset uh, function where you just define the initial state. And then if you look at the simulation part itself, you find, again, what we had before. So there's a simulation loop here. I do a busy idle just uh, to, uh, well, here's the busy idle, just to have a sort of fake real time. And then um, here you see the Euler method integration. So in this case, it's just a bit uh, contracted with the plus equal. Uh, notation, but basically it means uh, theta e equals theta plus uh, omega times the sampling period. And then uh, once more, um, for the 
um, yeah, omega, the rotational speed. Then the different uh, torque effects. So in this case, that's uh, the um, rotational uh, uh, version and not the linear version. And then at some point, there's the controller. I didn't uh, separate it nicely in this example, but usually you should. And the same again for the linear motions. So I got the sign that time is up, and uh, yeah, I would be happy to take some questions. Yeah, time is up, but you're not. We're not letting you go yet. <laughs> Because we do have time for questions. Out in the room, there are microphones. Please, if you have any questions, stand behind one of the microphones, and I will call out the microphone number, and you can, uh, you can ask a question. Please, don't be shy. It seems like there are a lot of you that are quite knowledgeable about the subject. We can stand up behind the microphones. We have a, micro a question from microphone number four. Yes, sir. Hello, and thanks for the talk. I would like to ask if you have the code somewhere available. Uh, yes, as I said, uh, all the examples that I showed are uh, on the uh, side of the talk itself. So uh, if you go in the far plan, then uh, there are links to where you can download these files. And Any other examples online somewhere? Uh, not from me. I mean, there are probably millions of examples, but uh, for this talk, I just created these ones. I just have one more for the drag with the drop, uh, drop with drag, um, which you also find. But uh, yeah, so this is uh, drop with drag. Yeah. So this is your chance if you want to ask any questions and share the answer to your question with the rest of us. Please get up to one of the microphones. And are there any questions from the internet? There is no signal from the sig signal angels. So is there a question from the internet? No. Good. Well, let's give, Marius, uh, let's give uh, Manuel a big round of applause. Thank you for his talk. Thank you.